Welcome to the Fragility Forum. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX. Although the topics we're here to talk about today are quite serious, it is a real pleasure to get to be with all of you. Um, I welcome you if you are joining us on World Bank Live, on Facebook, on Twitter, on the Hopin platform, however you're joining this discussion, it's a great pleasure to be with you virtually. I know there are many leaders and experts who are joining what has become an important moment on the humanitarian and the development calendar, and that's the Fragility Forum. And it's an important moment because if you were to make a map of the world and look at the most challenging places in the world when it comes to development, and make another map where we have some of the most, the biggest challenges when it comes to fragility and conflict and violence, you would find that those two overlaid quite neatly. Uh, we are at a 30 year high in violent conflict as DevX has recently reported. It's an important moment for the world to take stock. And so I'm very glad to be asked to be a part of this opening plenary today. And, and I welcome again, all of you who are here. We will shortly be hearing um, from the vice president of Sierra Leone, who is our keynote speaker, that's Mr. Mohamed Julde Jallo. We uh, will also then have a panel conversation. Uh, but to begin, I'm honored to pass the, the floor to the president of the World Bank Group, David Malpass, for his opening thoughts. David. Good morning and good day to everyone. I want to thank you for having me open this year's Fragility Forum. Uh, welcome to everyone uh, who is participating, and thank you to the speakers the panelists and the organizers. The event this year takes place as a violent war is unfolding in Eastern Europe. There are no words that I can, that I can express uh, to convey the horror uh, for the Ukrainian people. Um, at the World Bank Group, we're doing everything we can to assist Ukraine uh, and the region. These are seismic changes in Europe and likely in the world. It's causing the largest refugee flow in Europe since World War II. It will have a massive impact on energy, grain markets, and food insecurity. Each development has serious negative consequences in developing countries. We're assessing the consequences and how the World Bank Group can respond, both in Eastern Europe and in fragile countries around the world. Conflicts around the world are having far-reaching social and economic impacts in Ethiopia, Somalia, Yemen, and Afghanistan, to name a few. I'm hoping this Fragility Forum will confront challenges and provide new ideas on how the international community can more effectively help people facing conflict and fragility. The recent trends are disheartening and tragic. Since we had the last forum two years ago, Fragility, conflict-related fatalities, and social unrest have increased dramatically. We estimate that 23 countries with a combined population of 850 million people currently face high or medium intensity conflict. The number of conflict countries has doubled over the past decade. This has triggered massive refugee flows. Beyond the tragic human cost, Fragility, conflict, and violence threatens efforts to end poverty. Over 300 million people in these settings experienced acute food insecurity in 2021. Conflict, fragility, and violence cut across all income groups, and the poor are the most affected. They add to the damage caused by COVID-19 and now by the Ukrainian war. Our Estimates show that hundreds of millions of families are suffering reversals in development and most significant economic crisis in almost a century. Indicators of poverty, growth, inequality, nutrition, education, and security are all rapidly deteriorating rather than improving as we would hope in a developing world. In addition, rising inflation and interest rates are hitting the world's poorest the hardest. The global landscape is increasingly complex and includes longstanding and new challenges to peace, development, and prosperity. First, we're living in a world where protected armed conflict keeps increasing, as we've seen in the Middle East and Africa, where immensely destructive impacts are reversing decades of progress in development. Second, the pandemic has hit societies that are already in turmoil, food systems that were already impacted by climate change, and populations already displaced by conflict. 
Our estimates show that because of COVID-19, about 20 million more people in countries affected by fragility, conflict, and violence are now living in extreme poverty. Third, climate change is a threat multiplier. It's placing major strain on economies and societies, particularly in fragile settings. And while adaptation is key to minimizing the negative consequences of climate change, countries affected by conflict and fragility face considerable challenges in mobilizing funds. And equally worrying are the new acute and destabilizing political crises, including coup d'etats, as well as the unfreezing of old conflicts and the emergence of new interstate wars. Addressing the challenges of fragility, conflict, and violence requires a strengthened international cooperation and deeper collaboration with government, civil society, and the affected populations themselves. The delivery of weapons that enter fragile and conflict-affected situations must be stopped. And the overhang of firearms and landmines left from previous outbreaks of violence must be reduced. A reduction in tensions also requires stricter regulation of international security contractors. Focused international agreements should bolster human and economic development in fragile and conflict-affected situations, providing them with access to affordable medicines and basic services. The macroeconomic response to inflation must avoid taking the developing world into a new phase of economic turbulence. And workable mechanisms should be adopted to restructure the debts of the poorest countries, increase the transparency of their terms, and reduce the burden on people in those countries. Over the last decade, the international community has been working across the humanitarian, peace building, and development agendas, recognizing that sustainable peace is no longer a matter of just ending wars. Rather, it means addressing complex political, social, and economic drivers of conflict. Collectively, we've made progress, but it's not enough. A key part of this is broadening our partnerships and collaboration at the country level. We need to work hand in hand, not only with governments, but also with civil society, the private sector, and directly with communities. For example, the World Bank Group's support to Yemen has been implemented for years in concert with longstanding partners at the United Nations and local organizations. This is how we've been able to strengthen the country's health systems, restore electricity, provide cash transfers, and support displaced populations. The World Bank Group has been active in fragile settings from our very inception, and the support to countries affected by FCV has deepened over the last decade. Most recently, over the last four years, we've nearly doubled our footprint in fragile locations, reaching over 1,200 World Bank Group staff at present. The World Bank has significantly increased its support to countries affected by fragility and conflict, from $3.9 billion in fiscal year 2016 to $15.8 billion in fiscal year 21, a huge increase. Our current FCV strategy provides a basis for differentiating our response at every stage of fragility and conflict, helping prevent or mitigate risks in fragile environments, ensuring that we remain engaged in active crises and conflicts, and working to ensure sustainable recovery in post-crisis transitions. This strategy has given us the basis for a new generation of policies, analytical, and operational tools. This year's Fragility Forum provides all of us an opportunity to take stock of the current state of fragility in the world and to identify priority issues going forward. I hope that the discussions during the forum will help deepen our understanding of challenges related to fragility and set the concrete actions and priorities for the international community, for governments, and for people working to reverse the alarming trends we're seeing now. I want to thank you all and wish you a very good discussion today. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. Thank you um, to the World Bank Group again for this Fragility Forum, and I'm honored to bring to the virtual stage our next speaker, 
uh, Dr. Mohamed Julde Jallo, who is the Vice President of the Republic of Sierra Leone, and has had a whole career working on these issues, beginning in Kosovo and Mali, uh, working across the Sahel. Um, so I'm eager to, and at the International Crisis Group as well. Um, so I'm very eager to hear from, from you, uh, Vice President Jallo. Uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, good, good, good afternoon from, from West Africa, city of Dakar. First of all, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the World Bank for inviting me to this Fragility Forum to foster exchange of ideas on issues of fragility, conflict, and violence. I agree with the World Bank president that it is an opportunity to take stock of, but also more importantly, it's an opportunity to, re to rethink new modes of intervention to help country move out of fragility. Sierra Leone, like you all know, has a very long history, uh, fragile context emerging from this brutal civil conflict to Ebola, and now coping with the damaging realities of COVID-19. In the 1990s, just a brief history, it was evident that the Sierra Leonean state collapsed under the weight of bad governance resulting in conflict. The indicators then pointed to poor socioeconomic and governance landscape deteriorating human and physical security, weak service delivery, leading to weakening of a national cohesion. Over the years, reversing fragility in Sierra Leone entails rebuilding a cohesive society and nation, enhance good governance within a specific, with a specific focus on strengthening the rule of law, build credible and accountable state institutions, more importantly, strengthen service delivery. Successive government since the end of the war have been building on these gains. We have seen in Sierra Leone over the years successful, peaceful, transparent elections, steady social economic growth. But when we assumed office in 20, 2018, we continue to witness recurring as well as new drivers of fragility in Sierra Leone. Experience, we are now for the first time experiencing the risk associated with weak service delivery systems how the failure of delivery, essential services such as education, health, security is impacting on the population, <clears throat> particularly the rural poor. We have seen how cuts, reduction in support and budgetary allocation to the security and defense forces is impacting their capacity to protect, provide security and defend the state. We are also seeing the stake realities of a demographic, demographic shift with a young and ambitious youthful population that are less skilled, disturbing political and economic issues, such as the burden of managing debts, inflation, and the contraction of the civic space. Climate as well as pandemics, in, including COVID-19. COVID-19 is both a health and a socioeconomic hazard for us. With, although with relatively very few cases, <clears throat> around 7,665 and 125 death, the socioeconomic impact continue to be very, very huge. How has Sierra Leone coped and fared on with the sources of fragility challenges? We as a country, we elaborated a medium national development plan that focused on addressing service delivery. The, under the leadership of His Excellency Julius Madabio, we carved that plan under focus to support human capital development with a strategic focus on improving human capital outcomes. Today, as a country, we are spending 22% of the budget on education. And we have free quality education for kids in the basic education, primary and secondary. Today, as a result of that free education, we have enabled parents, poor parents, to have additional money so that they can spend on livelihood. Today, the indicate, indicators are showing that we have added 7% of the Sierra Leonean population to schooling. Today, we are building more classrooms. We are keeping more girls in school. Equally, on the health sector, <clears throat> we have increased the budget. When we came in, it was 6%. Today, we have increased the budget to 11.6%. Although we are few percentage short of the Abuja declaration, but we intend to increase that by 2023 to 15%. In the health sector, 
we were bold enough to recruit 5,000 health workers to focus essentially on primary health care. The indicators are showing that today maternal and infant mortality are going down, although the ratio of healthcare workers to the population is still very high. In the energy access, <clears throat> when we came in, it was 16% energy access. We have improved that. Today, we are very close to 40%. We are working very hard to make a transition from utility energy to productive energy so that we can support an enabling environment that can attract investment. With regards to the security and defense forces, we have improved the conditions of service and enhanced the operational capability of the defense, capab uh, the defense uh, operational capability of the defense. But that is still a huge challenge, not only in Sierra Leone, but in most sub-Saharan African countries. I normally tell people that professionalism of security and defense forces comes with a price. It includes huge investment. But I only realize that how huge it is when we assume office as vice president, somebody working in the international crisis group in West Africa and for the UN in most fragile countries. I keep wondering at the time how these security and defense forces are coping in a context of very reduced costs for them. So professionalism is one key area to the most of the sub-Saharan African countries. i give you an example. If you go to a country like Guinea, or Burkina Faso, or Mali, and you see military officers, they wear different uniforms. It's not because it is stylistic, it's because in most of this country, officers are forced to buy uniforms even for themselves. So you can imagine in the context where officers are buying uniforms for themselves, the operational capability that will enable them to provide security for their people and for the country is largely diminished. Various programs designed also, we've designed various programs to create jo jobs for the youth, skills training. I want to acknowledge the support of the World Bank in that direction recently with a portfolio to support skills training for youth. The youth crisis further exacerbated by COVID-19 remains no doubt a slow motion conflict dynamics. On the economic front, when we came in, we made immense progress in microeconomic management, prudent physical discipline, reduce inflation, and then increase, increase revenue. All these gains today are at a risk of gradually being, re being reversed under the very weight of good governance, uh, under the very weight of COVID-19. On the political front, under the leadership of His Excellency the President, we enacted the Independent Media Commission Act in 2020 to expunge libel law from our books to enhance free speech in the country. We established the Independent Commission for Peace and National Cohesion to foster national unity and social cohesion as a result of the conflict and violence we saw after the 2018 elections. We established to enhance, to enhance discussions and create dialogue. We established the government civil society dialogue as a framework to foster dialogue with civil society. But this is still not enough to halt the progressive contraction of the civic space. Civil society today, we have seen the gradual reduction in supporting governance portfolios in most of this country. When you take countries like Burkina Faso, countries that have worked on, like Liberia, countries like Mali, in the last 15 years, you had very brilliant civil society, civil society actors, activists. Today, I was surprised to learn that in the last two, three years, most of this majority of these guys have found themselves in government because there is a growing, the fortunes in civil society enterprises growing, and governance portfolio to support civil society development in sub-Saharan Africa is gradually diminishing. As a result, vibrant outfits are closing down, and that is resulting in the contraction of the civic space. In Sierra Leone, we still have challenges how to support a vibrant and viable civil society. And we believe that this framework to enhance dialogue between them and government is still not enough. We are also trying best to overcome ethno-regional politicization in Sierra Leone. That is still a challenge because in Sierra Leone, the two major political parties are very strong, ethno-regional stronghold. How we are trying to expand the space so that political parties can become national, can become holistic, can be able to gather support from the parts of the country is also a big challenge. 
When it comes to COVID, I've already highlighted the immense, the immediate and slow motion impact of COVID. At the start, we designed a comprehensive strategy to respond to COVID along essentially three lines, the health, the social, and the economic. We designed our response looking into the future. COVID, <clears throat> for us, COVID-19 provided an opportunity to assess the future of healthcare delivery in Sierra Leone. As such, we tied our intervention to long-term investment in healthcare, sort of building a sort of a bridge between the current response and building a resilient healthcare infrastructure. Because we realized that even after Ebola, the healthcare delivery system collapsed. So whatever investment we make today in the response against COVID is seen as an investment to strengthen healthcare sector, particularly the healthcare infrastructure to be able to deliver primary healthcare. The, it dealt, the, the COVID-19 COVID dealt a heavy blow on the healthcare system, disrupting healthcare delivery as we focus more on the emergency, moving our attention from delivering primary healthcare. There's enormous social impact. We see the loss of jobs, the hospitality industry for countries like Sierra Leone and most other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Senegal here, collapsed. We saw increased food prices higher freight costs with increasing vulnerabilities such as food insecurity. Even before the outbreak of COVID, Sierra Leone was spending about $520 million to import food, of which $240 million alone was all right. We are struggling to meet the foreign exchange demand for food importation. The global, the global trade disruption uh, chain, the global food uh, distribution chain was disrupted. As a result, you have high freight causes today. To import food in Sierra Leone today is a serious burden, not only for businessmen, but that burden is also transferred to, to, the, local, to the local population. We saw rising costs in food, in food prices and essential commodity. So what happens is that government is now forced to move to subsidization. So today, if you want to characterize the politics, the governance politics in Sierra Leone, it is what you would call the politics of subsidization. Government is forced to subsidize food prices to reduce vulnerability and social tension. So this has no doubt created a shift for us. That now there is a focus for shift from capital spending, from spending in the productive sector to subsidizing food. We subsidize almost everything. Fuel, rice, wheat, cement, drugs, everything. So as a result, it has eaten into our plan to enhance and develop the productive sector. Therefore, resources meant for capital investment are now diverted to social spending. It has also weakened our capacity to control inflation and manage the debt. On food security, food, food insecurity was it. The World Food Programme undertook a survey in Sierra Leone in early, in early mid and mid-2020, capturing the conditions immediately before COVID and during COVID, and find out that one million additional people in Sierra Leone became food insecure during the first half of 2020. Some of the emerging coping mechanisms included the sale of productive assets, the sale of productive assets such as land, and machinery to buy food. In 2021, in Sierra Leone, rural food poverty was about 60%, and over 80% of rural inhabitants resorted to the same coping mechanism. Imagine a country like Sierra Leone that have access to a port. What will you say about landlocked countries who have to pay countries like Mali, like Burkina Faso, like Niger, like Chad, who have to pay additional transportation costs to reach out to region. So when you look at what is happening in countries like Mali, where you, where you have from Timbuktu to Bamako alone is 1,000 kilometers. From Bamako to Gao alone is 1,003 kilometers with poor road network. Food prices in those, in those regions become so high that those countries outside of Bamako had to depend on neighboring countries. It's what you call classically in French, in French, deterritorialization. That is, you create a situation where the capacity, the capability of the state is reduced to an extent that it does no longer control and support its region. So the regions depend on neighboring countries. So the region has to find for themselves and then gradually weaken central government capacity to exert control on those regions, which explains the cycle of conflicts in the Sahel. 
It has also re reinforced vulnerability, thus reducing the capability of this state. These are fertile grounds for conflict and cycle of violence. We have seen a further expansion and deepening of fragility landscape during the COVID-19 pandemic with coups and counter coups in West Africa. These, these some three of these three of the countries that have benefited the most from financing development aid instruments designed to address fragility have been taken over by coups. Mali, Burkina Faso, Chad, and now we have Guinea added to that. When you closely analyze the political dynamics in this country, it is evident that three of these countries are in the Sahel and they share the same, the same political and social dynamics, such as constrained civic spaces and the inability for them to be able to reach out, to extend governance to their regions. Responses to unconstitutional changes of government in West Africa has not yielded the desired dividend. As of now, it is largely uncoordinated. We need a common multilateral platform to reverse unconstitutional changes of government. There is a need for the international community to rethink a sanction regime that targets the drivers of coup, while at the same time, take very tough stance against civilian regimes that show utter disrespect for the rule of law and respect for human rights. Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I now want to share with you some perspective on the role of the international community to supporting countries to move out of fragility in the short term. Mr. Vice President, I hate to interrupt, but I just want to mention that we are a little over time. If you might please uh, come come to the end of your remarks soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very thank you. Thank you very much. What I wanted, what I, what I what I wanted to say, it is clearly evident that fragility is deepening. Development calls for a strong and coordinated international effort. So I just want to share two points with you. First, these are very deep. These are these transition. These are uncertain times. These uncertain times call for extraordinary leadership. The transition we have to support countries in West Africa to transition from redistributive to productive capacity. This should be supported by this should be supported by investment in infrastructure such as energy, technology, and good road network. We have to support the governance space. We have to provide support so that governance portfolios. We have to also rethink the methodology and the tools of windows of fragility support to make it more flexible. There needs to be long-term predictable and sustained investment coupled with smart domestic and international policy that promotes well-being, not just an economic bottom line. We do often prioritize strengthening the economic outcomes without addressing whether those benefits are felt equitably across our population. Prioritizing education, health, access to clean energy and housing that support individuals and families will elevate communities and poverty. Equally, what we value and measure must reflect our priorities. We must measure economic equality across our population, reduction of poverty and progress and progress towards clean energy, environmental sustainability. These uncertain times, Mr. President, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, calls for extraordinary and bolder leadership from all of us, from elected officials to private sector and multilateral institutions. I want to encourage the international financial institutions to stay focused. We know that there are crises, but interventions that support well-being and the promotion of communities, community development, supporting international NGOs to continue to support vulnerable populations is critical. On that note, I want to thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Jalo, uh, for excellent remarks, and I think a great framing that leads us well into our panel conversation. I'd like to ask our panelists to, to please come on screen if they can, and I'll just mention who you are, and we'll begin our, our conversation and get into many of the issues that we just heard from the Vice President and from, from David Malpass as well. Um, we have with us uh, Minister Osman Mamadou Khan, who is the Minister of Economic Affairs and Promotion of Productive Sectors in Mauritania. We have Connie Wignaraja, who is the Assistant Secretary General for Asia and Pacific at UNDP. We have Susanna Moorhead, who is the Chair of the OECD's Development Assistance Committee, or DAC. And we have Peter Maurer, who is the President of the ICRC. It's great to see all of you. Uh, thank you for being here at the launch of the Fragility Forum. And there was a lot that, that we heard from the first two sets of remarks. I'll, I'll just ask each of you to quickly, in very brief form, because we are running short on time, 
give us a sense, an overview of what do we do? Um, I think, you know, you, you have your introductory remarks probably prepared, but the basic framing is we're at this moment where fragility, conflict, and violence is getting worse, not better. And countries like Sierra Leone face very dramatic challenges around things like rising food prices. What do we in the international community do? Maybe I can begin with the minister and we'll go around from there. Minister Khan. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Vice President of Sierra Leone. Good afternoon, uh, or good morning, Mr. President of the World Bank, ladies and gentlemen. I thank all of you for uh, giving the opportunity to Mauritanian official to share uh, our views on the fragility issue. Uh, sorry, I would like to speak in French, but I will try my English, my Mauritanian English with you. Uh, Mauritania is in a very specific situation regarding fragility. Uh, I will not mention uh, this pandemic because the pandemic is uh, something which is, has been experienced by all countries around the world. But Mauritania is specific regarding fragility because of two things. Climate change first, which is hitting us uh, severely, and uh, security and conflicts in, uh, in the Sahel region. <laughs> Uh, the climate change is affecting us uh, now, currently, because last year was a difficult year for us. There was no, almost no rain. And uh, people are suffering from that. We know that uh, there is uh, this uh, big initiative uh, with a lot of hope on it, this uh, Great Green Wall. Uh, with the summit last year in Paris, uh, in January 14, 2021, with uh, big pledges uh, from uh, various institutions, including the World Bank, $14 billion. But so far, we don't know how this will be spent. Uh, Minister of Charge of Economy, last uh, October, October, I participated in a ministerial uh, meeting on uh, the follow-up of these uh, pledges made in Paris, but there was no clarity on how it will be, uh, this amount will be utilized, this amount will be tapped on. And I think that one responsibility all of us have, and I'm calling on the international community, is to clarify uh, the way these amounts, these 14 billion that was pledged in Paris, could uh, be channeled to the countries where there is a great need uh, for them. And uh, I'm telling you, this year is a difficult year for Mauritanian people, not only for Mauritanian people, but I'm an official from Mauritania. I will speak only for Mauritania now. Uh, we have to import uh, cereals. And uh, as you know, the conflict in Ukraine is not helping. The Vice President of Sierra Leone has just mentioned uh, the need to, sub uh, to, sub to subsidize uh, a lot of products, but subsidize with, with what resources? And this is a big issue. Anyway, many projects may be deferred to subsidize these projects, and uh, this is not good for the future. The second specificity Mauritania has is being part of the G5 uh, Sahel. In this uh, Sahel region, where there are uh, conflicts, very severe conflicts, uh, people die every day, and uh, I think it's not uh, by chance that uh, in some countries there have been coups and counter coups. Counter -coups. Uh, in uh, some of the five countries uh, forming uh, form the G5 uh, Sahel, Mauritania is one of them, is one of the Sahel countries. Uh, thank God there are few people dying. Uh, uh, from uh, terror attacks, from uh, violent attacks. That's, uh, we thank God for that, but we thank our army for that, and we thank our budget for that, because m most of our resources are channeled to support the army. And this also costs a lot. It costs a lot uh, to build uh, capital, to, to do investment, and also to, pre to prevent the violence, because to prevent the violence, we need to invest on social services basic social services. And now there's a conflict on that. Where to put the money? For the army? Or to prevent violence in investing in uh, health, in uh, school, uh, 
uh, in uh, roads, in water, uh, etc. There is a conflict, and the international community has a role to play on that. Mauritania is not is not classified uh, as a fragile country. I always wonder why, uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we should not fight to be a fragile country. But the fact is that we are surrounded uh, by conflicts. Uh, we are part of Sahel. Uh, we are going. Uh, we are uh, experiencing the consequences of the climate changes. Uh, all this is affecting our people. Our people are, is affecting the way we are using our resources. And uh, we have to take initiatives by ourselves and uh, we get support, national support, uh, bilateral support, uh, multilateral support from some institutions, including the World Bank. Uh, we are very thankful to what the World Bank is doing uh, in, uh, in Mauritania, especially these uh, two last years. Uh, but the needs are there and we need much more than that. What we have done specifically uh, this year, uh, May I just ask you, to, Minister, we, we need to move on. It can maybe finish that thought briefly and then we'll move to our next speaker, please. Just I wanted, to, I, would, I wanted to give this example because I think that it was interesting to share, to share it with, uh, with you. Uh, there is a, a region near Mali where most of the refugees are uh, very close to the violence in Mali. What we did recently is to organize a round table uh, with all the donors, member of what we call uh, Alia Sahel. And uh, we developed first uh, a strategy uh, for, this, uh, for this region. And uh, the donors belonging to Alia Sahel have come and then uh, accepted to, to fund what we proposed uh, to them. And it's an experience which we have to repeat in many other regions in the, in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister Khan. And, and it's interesting to hear the resonance between your points and the points we heard from the Vice President, Vice President Jalla, on the tension that exists in terms of how to prioritize in your budget between security spending directly, direct health and education delivery, food and the rising food prices. All of these things are so immediate now, front page stories as they should be. Susanna, this is what you work on every day at the OECD. Maybe you can give us your, your thoughts on where we go from here as an international community. Yeah, thank, thanks uh, very much, Raj. Um, I mean, look, what do we do? I think four things. The first is don't give up and don't despair. Um, you know, we have to keep investing in, in prevention, however hard it is. Uh, it is worth doing, even though, though perhaps some might say it doesn't work. Uh, and we have to keep working at collaboration between the World Bank, the UN, bilateral agencies, partner governments, civil society, and, and others. Uh, this is what you know, we call the humanitarian development peace nexus. Uh, we've made a huge amount of progress, but there's a lot more to be done um, and do involve many, many more women in the process. We know that that works. Um, the second is to be patient. I, I realize it's 10 years since that landmark World Development Report was published, I think it was 2011. I, I was the, uh, the United Kingdom's executive director on the World Bank board at the time. And the thing I remember most about that document was that recovery from fragility takes decades, not years. Um, sadly, what we're seeing in Ukraine, destroying years of development takes minutes. Um, but we have to be patient. This is a long haul, and I think the, uh, His Excellency's interventions on, on Sierra Leone bore, bore testimony to that. The third is to be generous. Um, now, we've just had an enormous interim IDA replenishment. Uh, Development Assistance Committee members are by far the most generous donors to both IDA and the replenishment. Um, but we need more resources. I mean, my personal view, and it is a personal one, is that the resources that will have to go into Ukraine at scale should be additional. I don't think that the 80 plus million refugees and many, many tens of millions more in the world who were already hungry or displaced before this terrible crisis should be the hidden victims of Russia's aggression. Uh, we'll be discussing this in the committee at the end of the week, but I really call on everybody uh, who's listening to this to to dig deep and realize that we have to invest in in recovery and success from from day one. 
Um, and my final point is don't forget about the longer term. I mean, uh, President Malpass mentioned climate change. Uh, many, many of the poorest people in the world are already living with the consequences of climate change. And it would be um, a fatal error to think that we can somehow push this down the road if we don't tackle this at the same time as the other crises of fragility and debt and, and finance, uh, we really will be in very, very dire straits uh, in the not too distant future. So a bit pessimistic, but I think we've made a lot of progress despite all the bad news. And we just have to redouble efforts and, and remind ourselves that you know, this is a global crisis and it requires global solutions. And the World Bank, I think, is uniquely placed to help us tackle those. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And four excellent points. And just to underline your comment about uh, funds going to Ukraine for the response there. And if you think about what we've heard from our, our colleagues here in Mauritania and Sierra Leone, already the food price increases, which will come as a result of that war, are already going to put a strain on budgets for many fragile countries. It would be a real disaster if also development assistance was reduced to support the response. So a very important point you're making. Let me bring in um, Connie, if I can. We have Connie Wignaraja, again, the Assistant Secretary General for Asia Pacific at the UNDP. Thank you, Raj, and uh, Vice President Sierra Leone and World Bank uh, Group President Malpass and panelists, participants. It is a pleasure to address the Fragility Forum representing the UN and uh, with the political and human disaster, as, uh, as you have uh, said, unfolding in, in Ukraine. We must redefine what we are calling fragile and our collective response uh, to it. I think with the pandemic, this war, uh, the protracted conflicts, climate shocks and disasters, it's hard to argue that we're not at a breaking point fragility. And it's a stark choice. Uh, either we just break down, say we can't do anything about it and go home, or we really break through and do something different. When our, our UNSG introduced uh, the common agenda to strengthen and accelerate multilateral agreements, keeping the 2030 agenda at its core, we have to ask ourselves whether our current response to fragile situations is really the best that we can do. And now UNDP just launched, as you know, its human security report, and there was some stark evidence here. It says that despite improved human development over the past 30 years, six of seven people worldwide report that they feel a higher level of insecurity. And that is correlated to a higher level of mistrust. So 1.2 billion people now live in conflict affected areas. And interestingly, half in countries that we do not usually consider fragile. But the blind spot across North, South, East, West was the neglect of people's agency. Now, when I look at UNDP's recent surveys in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, there's a chilling trend. And Susanna pointed this out, as did the vice president and minister. Conflicts wipe out decades of development gains and push the majority of people into poverty at a much faster rate than before. And yet our collective response is to resort to short-term relief measures that we already know cannot address this. So yes, humanitarian assistance saves lives in the immediate days and weeks. But beyond that, Raj, we know it takes bold steps to jumpstart local economies, invest in trade and commercial activity, support the return of the banking sector to restart schools, small enterprises, uh, get the energy supply going, and local jobs. I think uh, our VP Sierra Leone made such a compelling case, uh, and this is not this is self evident. So we should ask, why do we wait so long? We know it's about the domestic market for food, for fertilizer, for seeds, for renewables, and essential services. Interestingly, we know it's about a public service that gets back and gets paid with everyone able to learn, earn a living wage, right? And not rely on handouts. So the months and years that we remain stuck in a continued cycle of emergency only pushes back real recovery. 
And we are part of that toll of fragility that becomes multi-generational. So in closing, I really hope this forum has the courage to debate these issues and question some of our fundamental premises of fragility and global investment to recent events. I think it must be planned the day before and executed the day after, which is a real nexus. No matter what we call it, you can call it nexus, humanitarian, plus early recovery, resilience, doesn't matter. And no one is impervious to the political realities and negotiations such a response recovers needs. Our, the UNDP crisis offer will be something different because we have to deliver a strategic plan in toughest conflicts now that are increasing the world over. So it is also heartening that the IFIs following the World Bank's lead have new fragility strategies. So let me add to what Susanna said, the big financial players, where you choose to spend early on makes a difference. It will take states, financing institutions, the bilaterals, private sector, NGOs, and the UN across our disciplines to work much harder at coming together much sooner, because it's not just about charting a path out of fragility, it is to get out and to stay out. Now that will be a state of peace with empowered agency and sustainable progress that really has meaning for all. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, thank you, Connie. And this idea of breaking down or breaking through, I think is so important and is a great framing, hopefully for this week of discussions. And maybe a great way to introduce Peter Maurer because Peter, you are so widely known for being someone who's pushing the humanitarian sector constantly in a new direction, looking for innovation, looking to extend past the traditional mandate. And I guess I wonder what your thought is in terms of where do we go from here? Thanks a lot, uh, Raj and colleagues. Great to be with you. And uh, from my side as well, I think what I heard in the last uh, 45 minutes is very much in sync uh, on what we uh, look as well as, a, as the key trait of uh, the challenges uh, we are facing. Increasing complexity, multidimensional violence, conflict, uh, climate change, pandemics, uh, economic insecurity, uh, it all combines and compounds to what I have called hyperfragility and what we have seen for a couple of years emerging. 80% of people displaced irregularly around the world come from roughly 25 contexts and these contexts become more numerous by the year and fragility are deepening. I think uh, we have seen that would be my second point that uh, over the last 10 years, the dynamics of violence and conflict have been key drivers of this fragility. It's fragmentation of actors in the battlefield in the 40 contexts in which ICRC has its largest operation. We count today more than 630 non-state armed groups, uh, which is a highly fragmented environment. We see weapons availability. David was talking about weapons availability in, in his introductory statement. Weapons get cheaper by the day food gets more expensive by the day. Uh, we see the criminalization of uh, political violence, uh, the mix of criminal and political violence emerging in many contexts. We see the urbanization of warfare with deep impact on societies, on systems, which changes fundamentally the way we think. We see in the case of Ukraine, global power competition mixing with regional conflicts, which gives yet another increased uh, dimension of fragility. And we have counted last year more than 120 million people living outside of state control in areas controlled by non-state armed groups. So these are some of the indicators coming to us as humanitarian organization. We see how different from one part and from one context to the other, fragility emanates. Uh, sometimes like in Afghanistan, it comes in post-conflict uh, situation, we increase fragility. Sometimes it's the direct urgent impact of violence and conflict as we see today in, in Ukraine. Sometimes it's the long-term effect of crisis, conflict, destruction, as well as economic 
uh, as we see it in, Ser in Syria and Lebanon. So we have to be contextual to understand the dynamics of uh, each one of these contexts. So what to do? Very briefly, I can uh, just very much join what Kani uh, said in her introduction. I would really, as you said, Raj, I have advocated for a new understanding of what humanitarian is. We can't understand humanitarian just that as short-term emergency relief. We have to be in the most uh, critical points to do much more systemic, much more long-term, much more uh, uh, stabilization work through uh, humanitarian work. It needs a new understanding of our tools. We have to break down silos and have joint up approaches, value chains, in of uh, delivering to people services to people. We need more flexibility in our mandates and understandings because we have still too many bureaucratic and procedural obstacles which stay in the way of working together and have those joint up approaches that Kani was advocating for and which I fully embrace. I think uh, we have to look at risk and how to de-risk uh, our activities in the hyper-fragile context because many of the actors, those with mandates and money and credit lines and accountability procedures don't, can't take the risk uh, to work with their tools in the places where uh, work is needed. And so we need to look really at the way we work uh, quite fundamentally. But uh, I'm very much uh, uh, really satisfied also that the Fragility Forum has become a place of integrating humanitarian development, peace, security, and other dimensions which are so critically important. If I can add one thing just coming back from Niger is really this strong impression that uh, we see all those fragilities uh, emerging and on most of the innovative approaches, innovative finance, innovative approaches to community, land ownership, production, everything which is needed, we see a lot of institutional and political obstacles to overcome. In order to overcome, uh, again, we need those joint up uh, approaches in which each of us plays to, its, to his own on her strength, but at the same time, we understand each other as a response system and not as individual responses. I'll stop it here. Thank you so much, Peter. And one issue that might really be at the center, if you're taking a joined up approach right now, if you're doing, as Connie described at UNDP, a planning effort that cuts across traditional humanitarian and development divides, might very well be food prices. We've heard it from both the vice president and the minister. And I wonder maybe Connie or Susanna, do either of you have a take given how urgent and of the moment this issue is on how we ought to address this issue of rising food prices and the, the strains it will place on humanitarian and development budgets and the potential for increased fragility that will come from it. Would either of you like to comment on that on that topic? Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid, Raj, I don't have an answer. I think it goes back to, I mean, to what a lot of people have said. One is that, you know, there, there are going to be inexorable price rises in some parts of the system. And I, I don't think short term or even medium term, it'll be it'll be easy to to um, mitigate them. But the only way to do it is to make sure the system works more smoothly. So you you join up the humanitarian and development actors where possible. You protect food production. Um, you know that's often a sort of unintended consequence of conflict. Um, and and I think thirdly, you I mean the sort of the striking point that that weapons are now cheaper than food. You know, this this short term, this is going to take more resource um, if if we are going to to feed people. Um, and and I think, you know, if we look back at the sort of terrible famines of the the seventies and eighties, there are maybe some lessons there to to pull out and think about. You know, pre positioning stocks, um, where you buy it, uh, how you make sure that it it gets to the people who need it. And and you know, we have new instruments now to help target it through social protection programs and other things. But it's what, I mean, everyone has really been saying is don't delay. You know, the more that you can prepare and protect 
uh, I don't want to say the cheaper it will be, the less expensive it will be, the more lives you will save. And I think the more likelihood there is that you can protect livelihoods as well. Yeah, Connie, you've got this new strategy at UNDP. I wonder how you will roll out that strategy in places like Afghanistan, places like Myanmar, under these conditions that we're facing now, where, as we heard from the vice president uh, and the minister, governments now have to choose between subsidizing food, which is essential, and what they would spend maybe on defense or state security or on development programs, health and education. And they're, they're in a very difficult position trying to make that balance work. Well, to pick up also from what Susanna said, I think, uh, Raj, maybe three quick points. Um, first is that uh, from the day before, not, not uh, six months after, uh, we've got to get into protecting community livelihoods because that keeps the domestic market, the local markets open and, and liquidity flowing through. And particularly uh, to try and not distort uh, the local food market. Um, and here, I think coming in fast, uh, but early on, having uh, protected uh, food production, I think is a huge uh, part of that new um, approach to, to looking at uh, prevention. So it's not just the physical infrastructure, it's also the social infrastructure. Um, I would add there that we've got to look at a very different way of um, social protection. I'm not even sure we should use that term, but it's making sure that people have a basic income uh, in order to be able to feed themselves and their families. Um, so that's one. The second is, I think, um, looking at how uh, the local uh, financing uh, sector of the food market, uh, which includes then things like uh, credit guarantee schemes for farmers uh, to buy seeds, buy fertilizer, uh, and be able to survive these uh, major multiple shocks uh, is key. And this is what we're, we're trying uh, both in Afghanistan and, uh, and Myanmar. And finally, maybe to say that um, we cannot um, put all our financing instruments, whether they're market instruments, uh, whether they're ODA instruments uh, in one basket. And the more we diversify uh, the ability to, to look at finance, and that includes uh, supporting um, countries, states, uh, bring down the cost of their debt and, and expand a little bit that fiscal space. Uh, I think is is absolutely essential. Uh, so these, to me, would be uh, key ways in which uh, UNDP would come in uh, very strong uh, in um, increasing areas of fragility. We are running out of time, but I want to just very briefly hear from Peter, and then I want the minister to, to close us with the last thought. Um, Peter, is there an example that, where you see this working somewhere, some example of innovation where you know, we heard a lot about service delivery, for example, which is traditionally thought of as a development activity, but where we bridge this divide between humanitarian and development, and that is reducing fragility in some contexts? Very briefly, please. Well, very briefly, I think the most successful parts are really in the water and sanitation part, where we have managed to get out of short-termism into system building. Uh, we uh, are driving a project together with the World Bank on Goma water system. We have similar projects in Maiduguri in difficult and hyper-fragile contexts where water trucking is replaced by systematic and system stabilization. Uh, very similar with regard to food production, where we manage to have really uh, to go down in, in, in the Sahel, we decreased food distribution by 30% last year and increased uh, seed distribution in order to have productive uh, processes coming forward. Even in the worst economic and fragile situations, we are managing to have income generating activities replacing distribution activities. These are just Three short examples, uh, just to very, very helpful to hear if we work together. It's very helpful to hear how we can do this. I know we're almost out of time, but Minister Khan, we'd love to have you close out our panel, if you would, with your final thought, um, having heard this rich discussion today. Okay, uh, thank you. I would like to thank all those who have uh, intervened. Uh, just very, very briefly uh, to say that I would like to see debt, debt being converted into actions 
for soil regeneration. I would like to see support from the international community to help us provide water, provide uh, uh, housing, provide education to the people in the remote areas which are uh, affected or which are in contact with a violent, uh, violent terrorist. I would like the support, uh, see people, international community supporting us to give hope to people who are in these very, very remote, uh, remote areas and who are at, uh, there, where there is temptation for them to go with the violent people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Minister. And I know all of you who are following this along are at least at home, virtually clapping somehow. I, I know there's a great response to this very rich conversation on a very serious and tragic set of issues, but it's good to hear that there are progress, that there's some leadership, and I appreciate the Fragility Forum really raising the attention and the volume on the criticality of these issues right now. So thank you for all of you who are joining us from around the world, and my thanks to this fantastic panel, to the Vice President. Thank you for being a part of this, and it's been an honor to help kick off uh, this year's Fragility Forum. Thank you.